we're a big Italian family. My father has five brothers and sisters, so there are six. And at some point, all of them have worked in the business. And as the business grows, it creates this complex dynamic that is, I am a shareholder, but I also work in the business and sometimes not as upper management. To give an example, I have an aunt who was a category manager. She was not in upper management, but she was a shareholder who sat at the shareholder meeting, but she had two levels of hierarchy below my father. So that creates some interesting dynamics that arose between the second generation. They didn't want us to think of Zona Sul as a career choice. They wanted to have clear rules, and that's a decision they made. I grew up with the business. The business was growing as I grew up. I was frustrated. What do you do with your life when you realize that you can't have the very thing that you've always wanted? Well, find something else, find another career path. Well, sure, but the process of finding something else can be very time consuming and overwhelming. For example, where are you even supposed to start? Now, with the proper framing and tools, it doesn't have to be such a gnarly challenge that could take forever to overcome. That's what we're going to focus on in this episode. Hi, my name is Esther Choi, the executive producer and your host of the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises' own podcast series, Family in Business, a podcast that features stories of leaders, their families, and the enterprises they transformed. In the previous episode with guest Megan Jude, we've explored how her family has processed all the good and bad that gets handed down through her multi generational family enterprise. And how she sustains herself as a family enterprise leader. In this episode, we are going to hear the story of another family enterprise leader who, up until he was 18 years old, had wrapped his whole identity and purpose around his family enterprise. But because of the decision that his elder generation handed down to his generation, he had to find his purpose somewhere else. Together with our show's advisor, Dr. Jennifer Penegas at Kellogg's War Center, and a new guest expert, Dave Evans, a New York Times bestselling author of the book series Designing Your Life and Designing Your Work, we are going to dive right into Enhiko's leadership story. Who's Enhiko? My name is Enrico Letta. And I'm the managing partner of Vitalachi and Yorgos, a yogurt and fresh cheese manufacturer here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We are a dairy company and we manufacture fresh cheese under the brand Vitalate. And it's mostly fresh Italian cheese, mozzarella, burrata, ricotta, scarmosa, which is a cheese for pizza. And in 2014, we launched Yorgos, which is our strained yogurt、uh, line. And we make fresh, all natural strained yogurt, which is like the very popular Greek yogurt in the US. I come from a 65 year old family business called Zona Su, which is a supermarket chain here in Brazil. The supermarket was started by my grandfather, Francesco Letta. Who is Italian, was born in Italy and fled to Brazil during World War II. Started making a living here any way he could in Brazil. Started working as a butcher, selling vegetables on the street,、uh, and then opened his first grocery shop in a corner in Ipanema in Rio de Janeiro. And from there, it grew to a small market and he added some more stores. Yeah, today Zona Sul is one of the top. Supermarkets in the country, even though it's only located in the state of Rio de Janeiro. It's located mostly in affluent neighborhoods with very differentiated mix of products and a lot of imported products, organic, a lot of differentiated services. My father, Fortunato, started running from a very early age and he took control of the company 
when he was his 30s and grew it to be the company that is today with over 45 stores here in Rio. And a, a very important to note, a very high sales per square foot, one of the highest in the country. How did your father do it? Well, it was more opportunistic than a brilliantly devised strategy, to be very honest. Rio de Janeiro has a, a geography that, you know, the affluent neighborhoods are, are very concentrated. So much like Manhattan. So if you imagine Manhattan, it's a very dense geography. The business started doing well with the supermarket and they started expanding, but very focused on this region, which is called the Southern Zone in Portuguese, Zona Sul. And it's the Southern Zone of Rio de Janeiro where the affluent neighborhoods are. Zona Sul started growing in this area and it became the dominant player of groceries. And it naturally became a dominant force in this area where it was very hard for other players to come in. So my father, when he took the role of, you know, president or CEO, they had four stores and he started a, a very quick expansion through the 90s and, and 2000s, focused on this area and also focused on a very differentiated service and mix of products. The first important fact is that we come from an Italian heritage. Both my grandfather and my grandmother came from Calabria, the south of Italy, during a very difficult economic period, and they were able to prosper here in Brazil. Uh, so the connection to Italy was very strong and our family grew around, you know, big family events, meals where everyone enjoys themselves and, and enjoys great food that my grandfather Rosa still makes to this day. So there's always a very strong connection to food. So this high value on, on food was always there in my family. I think that's something that's been passed on through generations. So I think when we set out to do something related to food, it has to be of high quality. I think that's just inherent in us. In Enrico's case in particular, it's so interesting to listen to him about the purpose of food. That's Professor Jennifer Pendergast, Executive Director of the Kellogg's Ward Center for Family Enterprises. So they came from Italy, which of course we all think about like great food in Italy anyway, right? But they came because they were poor and had no way to feed themselves. And so feeding people, that's really core and important to them as a purpose. And also food is something that brings people together. They believed in the core purpose of what they did. And they're so proud of being part of that and want to perpetuate that. I think the values of good food was passed on by the business. It's always very customer driven. And if it's customer driven, you have to offer the highest and the best quality. And it started with you know, vegetables and fruits, you know, so which has to be something very fresh and well picked. So I think that was always in the center of the business and the family. So what happened? Why did G2 decide that G3 could not work in or be part of the business. It was problems related to being a large group of shareholders who also worked in the business in the second generation. We are a big Italian family. My father has five brothers and sisters, so there are six. And at some point, all of them have worked in the business. And as the business grows, it creates this complex dynamic that is, I am a shareholder, but I also work in the business and sometimes not as upper management. So to give an example, I have an aunt who was a category manager. She was not in upper management, but she was a shareholder who sat at the shareholder meeting, but she had two levels of hierarchy below my father. So that creates some interesting dynamics that arose between the second generation. G3, as you can imagine, is also a very large group. I think we're about 18 cousins. I'm the oldest. I'm turning 40 this year. 
and we have from 40 to a five-year-old, you know, so it's a large group and a large age difference. But our role in the business is we are working together as a group to define our role in the business, which is still undefined. We're still not shareholders. We don't own shares in, in the business and we don't participate actively in the business. There was an important decision that the second generation made regarding our generation, which was, I think, in the end of the 90s, they decided that they weren't letting our generation join the business until they had clear policies of succession. So that was set when, you know, me and some of my cousins were about to turn 18. They didn't want us to think of Zona Sul as a career choice. They wanted to have clear rules, and that's a decision they made. From what we learned, it was based on a lot of negative experiences in the supermarket industry in transitions from G2 to G3, where especially in Rio de Janeiro, we knew of some supermarket companies that went bankrupt during this transition. So that's a decision they made. That's the decision that we grew up with. I was frustrated because I grew up with the business. The business was growing as I grew up. And my father was obviously 100% involved. My father is a healthy workaholic, you know, like he works from Monday to Monday. He wakes up at 4.30 a.m. And uh, his work is his main pleasure, was his main pleasure for, for, for much of his life. You know, he didn't enjoy taking vacations, you know, when he traveled, it was mostly to visit other supermarkets or to go to trade shows. And sometimes he took me along with him, but uh, I grew up in that environment, you know, and I, I was with him, I, you know, I helped shelve, I helped uh, stock new stores. So when I thought of business, my reference was always Zona Su, and, and when I thought of a businessman, the reference was always my father. So there was naturally a very strong desire to be involved with the business and to work with my father. It was frustrating. That's how Enrico ended up in this limbo state. Enrico and his brother Patrick and many of his cousins were around mid to late teens when G2 made a decision that G3 couldn't work for the business, couldn't be part of the business, even though Enrico himself grew up wrapping his identity around the family business. However, the decision wasn't a final one. There's a chance that G2 could resolve its differences, revert their decisions, and allow G3 to join after all. But and again, they might not. So if you were in Enrico's shoes at the time, what would you do? How would you feel? Would you hedge your bet? And how do you come up with a purpose while being in limbo? Welcome back. When Professor Emeritus and co-founder John L. Ward retired, he donated all of his research work to Northwestern University. That is about 37 boxes of content with materials spanning the years of 1976 to 2017. And now this amazing body of work is digitized and available on our website, wardcenter.net. That's wardcenter.net. Make sure you take advantage of this body of research by Professor Ward. Now, it turns out that Enrico, his brother, and cousins were in limbo for about two decades. What did they end up doing? How did he wrap his head around his purpose on this new path that he didn't choose for himself? In change theory, there are two primary forces, pushes and pulls. You get pushed by pain, you get pulled by longing or love. They both work. You know, if you want to get pulled by something you're really attracted to, great. You want to get pushed by something, I've had it. We can't stay here any longer. Okay, whatever. So don't get picky about your forces of initiation. 
This is David Evans, you know, the co-founder of the Stanford Life Design Lab, and in this interview, most well-known as the co-author of Designing Your Life, followed by Designing Your Work Life, soon to be followed, by the way, this October, by Designing Your New Work Life, the second edition of the second book. And before that, 35 years in Silicon Valley, as you know, early days of Apple with Steve Jobs and those guys and co-founder of Electronic Arts. The mission of the Life Design Lab is to apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life. I am a big fan of design thinking. As a framework, it is very useful and can be applied to so many things in life, like life itself. Dave Evans and his co-author and collaborator Bill Burnett applied the principles of design thinking to help initially Stanford students to think about how to live a productive and joyful life. To scale the impact to the broader public, the pairs published the book Designing Your Life in 2016 and then Designing Your Work Life in 2020. So in a nutshell, how do you apply design thinking to your life so that you can live a life well-lived and joyful? Get curious, talk to people, try stuff, tell your story. And the middle two are prototyping, talk to people and try stuff, be in community and go do things. So those are the four steps, all involving being in a community and the emphasis is on doing. Number one, get curious. Number two, talk to people. Number three, try stuff. And number four, tell your story. The design mindsets of radical collaboration and bias to action. Life's an improv skit. We're making this up as we go along, but you can learn to be good at improv. You can learn to be good at the making it up as you go along skill set. That's what we help people do. So let's find out how Enrico made it up as he went along the decision that was handed to him that he couldn't fulfill his life's purpose by working for his family business. How did Enrico improv his way to his eventual purpose? Without knowing so, he had applied design thinking process to designing his life. I went to college in the U.S. I learned during college that this wasn't going to be an option. And by this, he's referring to the fact that he couldn't work for his family business. So, you know, I started exploring and I, I ended up in finance. I worked in, in finance for over four years, first in private banking, then some trading in investment banking. I was doing well. I was growing with the bank that I worked with, but I knew deep inside that that wasn't for me. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to create a product, you know, that I could touch and feel that I could serve to other people. And that was always inside of me. Having been in a similar situation myself at one point, and as well as coaching countless people in the stage of their career where they might be doing well, but still feeling that they're not doing what they're meant to do, I can really relate to what Enrico was experiencing. What do you do? When I sit down with young people contemplating what's my role going to be, I say, first of all, in our second book, we have a thing called, you know, look for uh, the BDO, not the BTO, the best doable option, not the best theoretical option. So sometimes it turns out you know, in life, you've got a really gnarly problem. Well, it turns out in many situations, you don't need to understand it and you don't need to figure it out. Because the truth is, there are only a handful of viable, implementable, doable alternatives, doable options. And if you can get a gnarly essay problem down to a simple multiple choice question, all you need to know is just about 1% more information than is the absolute minimum necessary to choose which option. Like I haven't got this all figured out and there are a whole bunch of things I still don't know, but clearly it's door number two. So you walk through door number two and you figure out the rest later. Now, if you're an upcoming member of one of these families, I would argue you have three, maybe four alternatives and pretty much that's it. So in 2009, I decided to quit my job in finance. I got an offer from a bank in New York and I took that job offer as a, a way to say, OK, I'm going to quit my job and think of, of, you know, next steps. And I decided to do an MBA post MBA. I got a job in, in consulting 
And in shopper marketing, which was a great experience, I led projects with supermarkets in the US and in Mexico too. So that was very interesting. But I also knew that consulting wasn't for me. At the time, my wife, Roberta, she got pregnant with, you know, our first daughter. And I, at that time, I had been in the U.S. for eight years. I thought, okay, so I think now it's time for me to move back. I love the United States. It's my second country. But I wanted to raise my kid here in, in Brazil, you know, close to their grandparents. And so that's when we decided to come back. And it was a great timing because... That was when I decided that I wanted to make yogurt <laughs> because Greek yogurt was exploding popularity in the U.S. It was around 2012. I was a heavy user of Greek yogurt. When I lived in Chicago and New York, brands like Chobani, which is our big inspiration, and Faye, and I thought, I have to do this in Brazil. I love this product. This is a healthy yogurt. It's full of protein, low in carbs, low in fat. This is the type of product that Brazilians will go crazy for. This is in 2012. And my brother, Patrick, had recently started a cheese business, Vitalate. He actually started in 2008. So I flew back to Brazil and I pitched him this project. I said, hey, Patrick, you got a dairy company here. You got the milk, you got the distribution. I have this idea for this great product that is, is exploding in the US. Let's do this together. And he said, yes, of course. In early 2013, I came back to Brazil to launch Yorgos, which was when we launched a year and a half later in 2014, was the first all natural strained yogurt here in Brazil. If you think about it, because Enrico's father's generation made the decision that G3 cannot work for the family business, he and along his brother and cousins had to get curious. They had to go away from the family enterprise to find where they belonged professionally. Getting curious was part one of designing his life. Then in part two of design thinking where you want to talk to people and prototype, that's Enrico's eight years in the United States, where he was getting his undergraduate degree, working in finance, banking, getting his MBA at Kellogg, and eventually working in consulting. Then now, part four, he can tell stories, right? Because at this stage, he has finally realized that he's an entrepreneur at heart. He needed to create things that he could touch and feel and serve to others. So he moved his family back to Brazil. He's ready to share with the world what his purpose is, right? What is your purpose? This is a big question. I don't have a definite answer. Welcome back. If you love learning from family enterprise leaders, dive into our podcast archive to hear other great stories. Just go to our website, wardcenter.net, click on resources, that's wardcenter.net. Now, I was wondering how Enrico would word his purpose once he figured out that he wanted to go back to Brazil and start his own business around good quality food. But... I was surprised by his answer. I don't have a definite answer. I think we are all learning human beings and, and I'm still evolving. I've had the great privilege of having a great education academically and also by my parents. I think my purpose is to leave the world a better place. You know, how exactly is something that, you know, I'm working on every day. One obvious way is first with my children. You know, I want to raise children that are well educated and, and confident to make a positive impact in the world, to do something they love and, and make a, a positive impact. Me personally is through my, my work. I'm very proud of employing hundreds of people and, and being a good employer. But most of all, we have a mission in Vitalachi and Yorgos, 
which is to have a positive impact in the nutrition of Brazilians. At this point of the interview, I was really puzzled. Shouldn't someone like Enrico, an entrepreneur, grew up in his family business, despite not being allowed to work in it, he found his way back to stay close to his family and his business by founding his own companies that complement his family business. Shouldn't someone like Enrico have an elegant sentence or two to say about his purpose? Why is his purpose statement sound so mm, generic? Make the world a better place. And why does he sound like he's struggling to come up with it? Well, it turns out it's not so straightforward, which has everything to do with why I really want you to hear Dave Evans' opposing view on finding and defining purpose. And while we're at it, let's hear what he has to say about another term, passion. How is passion different or similar to purpose? How are they related? Today, the most popular organizing question is, what's your passion? You know, which is kissing cousins to what's your purpose? Well, purpose kind of a little more elevated, but, uh, and I'll come back to purpose in just a second. But against passion, the research done by Bill Damon at the Center for Adolescence at Stanford, which goes to the age of 27, by the way, your neocortex isn't fully baked till you're 24 to 25. So, you know, it's hard to know. And this passion thing, 80% of highly competent, fully three-digit IQ bearing, you know, people who can dress themselves, 80% of those people answer the passion question with, I don't know yet, I haven't found one, or I've got a bunch, which one did you want to hear about first? So the question, what's your passion, finds eight out of 10 perfectly healthy people as being in need of remediation. Like, oh, you don't know your passion. Oh dear, that's so sad. Like you should know by now. All questions have belief systems. What's your passion believes, everybody has one, you'll know it up front. Once you discover it, it should be the organizing center of your vocation and the world will let you do it and preferably make a living of not make a killing while doing so. Those are false. They're all false. Most people who find a passion, they develop one in the process. It's the outcome of good work, not the beginning of good work. So what I argue is, because as soon as you say, I need to find my purpose, that question assumes there is one, there's one superior one, and it should be the organizing principle. And we don't know that to be the case. What I will say is, let's go live purposefully. So if I live on purpose, I want to live coherently. We define coherency as where who I am, what I believe, what I'm doing are in alignment. You know, I'm evolving my way forward. I mean, do I absolutely with great confidence know that I can declare that my lifelong purpose is available to me right now? If the answer is no, and I can't move forward till I find it, I've just decided to be stuck for the rest of my life, literally. And even if one, somebody did have one purpose, how many of them knew it before 30 or 35 or even 40? Very few. Let's get good at living purposefully, living into purpose and be purpose forming people and be formed by purpose. And then you may find, you know, I think this is a keeper. Live purposefully. Instead of struggling to come up with what your purpose or passion at the moment in time might be, live coherently, meaning who you are, what you believe in, and what you do should be in alignment. Don't let not knowing or not being able to define your purpose or passion prevent you from living your coherent life. Because finding your passion and purpose, according to Dave Evans, is a result of good work, not the beginning of good work. So Enrico went back to Brazil to start his Greek yogurt business, and he also made another important discovery. One that is of great values that Enrico's grandfather and father pass on to him, even more so than the family business. I started my new venture when I was in my 30s and the opportunity cost is very high. So I literally moved from New York City, Upper West Side of New York City, to a rural town in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, called Valença, which, you know, is less than 80,000 people, only farms. If you leave work after 8 p.m., there are no restaurants. I had to be away from my wife, from my kids for a long time to be in the plant. Things took a lot longer to take off than I had planned. 
being entrepreneur in Brazil is very hard. I think it's hard all over the world. In those first years, you know, where I sat down with my wife and I said, what have I done? You know, I, I don't think I made the right decision here, but now I'm too involved. I have to do this. Since this G2 had made the decisions for you guys not to be able to join the business, did they do anything in terms of supporting you guys and helping you, ideas, connections, financing? It was definitely support. There was no financing, but we started a food company having a client that was one of the top supermarkets in Brazil who opened the doors to us to test our products. Obviously, if the products didn't do well, it wouldn't stay there because they have a business. But having this door open eliminates a big part of the risk, you know, of starting a company and making high investments, especially in yogurt, where we had to make high investments in, in equipment to start this business. The family was supportive in the sense of having Zona Su as a client uh, who supported this business. But after the concepts were proven, the product started performing well. We started distributing our products nationally to supermarkets in the entire country. We were treated as a regular supplier, so there were never any, any favors. Uh, we were treated as a regular supplier. We have a great relationship. It was also a very interesting way to learn about the business, you know, as an outside supplier, someone who's doing business with the family business, but independently. Third generation has created very interesting, very healthy businesses apart from Zona Su, which if we would have joined, might not have existed. So in retrospect, uh, it can be said that it was a good decision. Something that I learned during this process of starting my own venture and also writing a case with Kellogg was this notion of transgenerational entrepreneurship. Transgenerational entrepreneurship. That's a very smart sounding term, but also a mouthful. What is it? And what was this thing that is of great value that Enrico's grandfather and father passed on to him, even more so than the family business? So almost every business was started by someone with some idea of doing something somewhat differently. But there was someone who was willing to take a risk. So the entrepreneurial gene to me isn't just, you know, I'm Steve Jobs or Bill Gates and I have an idea, but it could also be as well, you know, that I'm willing to take a risk and go out on my own and make no money and I'm responsible for myself and my family at that point. I think the challenge you see in families is like you, you have that gene in the first generation. You struggle, you scrap, you get by by the second generation. Maybe you've locked in. If you get to the second generation, you've locked into something successful, right? And then it all becomes about protecting it. Like, who we don't want to lose this. And then you lose that risk-taking mentality. I think that's probably more towards third generation. I find a lot of children of entrepreneurs tend to be entrepreneurial because like I grew up in a family with someone who worked in big Fortune 100 companies. And the idea of not having a pension and or a 401k and benefits was like something inconceivable to me, the safety net. But to others who grew up with the dad who like sold everything and put a card table in the middle of their apartment, and I can tell you so many stories of kids like that from very successful families, they don't get so scared about someone betting on themselves. They're like, oh yeah, you can do that. And if it doesn't work, you scrape by and you do something else and look at all, you know, we figure it out in the end. Or we only see the stories that figured it out in the end, right? It's a self-selection bias there. I think of it as the entrepreneurial gene but that gene is the gene that's not scared to bet on yourself and to believe that you can do something that you haven't probably done before and that you can sell it to someone they're going to buy it. You can make money doing it. You can support yourself. But it's hard to do that. One, because we tend in nature, I think, as human beings is to be risk averse and protective. And then also you get to a certain level of comfort and you have a lot more to lose, right? So... 
how you pass on that gene that says I'm willing to go try do something new and not just that, but I'm actually energized or excited by that idea enough that I'm going to give up whatever the other options are. One thing research shows about how to pass that on is literally the easiest idea of ideas, which is the sort of take your kid to work day. Kids that grow up in the business, sweeping floors, just doing the basic of basic from the ground up are the ones that are more likely to be engaged by it in an early age. Like that's the sort of apprenticeship model, right? That's how you used to do everything. The other thing I encourage entrepreneurs to think about is not just telling their kids what, but why, you know, because the fact that I did something is much less relevant than why I chose to do it that way. And by the way, if you don't know the why, sometimes you make the wrong interpretation of why they did it. And you might choose to keep doing something that they never would have kept doing because the why is going away. A very quick aside, great story I've heard, I've heard a family business tell is that you know, every year their mom would cut off the two ends of ham to stick it in the pan before they had it for the holiday. And one point down the road, someone said, mom, you know, what's so special? Why do you cut off the ends of the ham? And she said, I don't know. That's what your grandmother always did. So they went to the grandmother and said, so what, you know, what's the secret of cutting the ends off the ham? She's like, because I didn't have a pan that was big enough to fit it there. So if you had asked the why instead of the what, you would have realized that with the bigger pan, though, it was no longer relevant to lose the ends. There's a lot of stories like that in family businesses, the understanding the why is really important. And then the other thing is being willing to let your kids see failures. So for every you know idea you tried, there's probably five others that didn't work and much more you could learn from those five than the one that did. Because frankly, the one that did could have been luck, circumstances, timing, anything else that you can't replicate. But the ones that you didn't helped form where you were. So the concept of really going back to storytelling, right? walking through and explaining how we got to where we were and how those things happen. First of all, there's great learning embedded in that because you can't have your child sit there for all the years you did something. But second, they lose some of that risk of failure because they realize that you failed. So you're more likely to create a culture that lets them fail which is really, really important. So I think that combination of, you know, really sitting by your side, explaining more of the story behind why things happened, and then, you know, being willing to share the failures along with the successes are pieces that can really help build that transgenerational entrepreneurship. Because in the end of the day, if you think about where this whole concept started for this podcast of being a family in business, is that if you look at very old multi-generational families, they're never in the same business that they started in because the world around them has changed, right? So if you can let go of the notion that I am an X business and instead I'm a family in business, which is, means that I'm a family trying to perpetuate its wealth across generations and develop new ideas and create new engines of growth, those come from transgenerational entrepreneurship, right? So any seed of one could be something that could be your next big business and the other one may go away or get sold or something else. But if you don't keep reinventing yourself, where's that going to come from? What became clear to me is that the great value in what my grandfather did and what my father did was not the business in itself, but it was the example of being entrepreneurs. And that's something that I would like to carry on. I think today, business is changing very rapidly. We don't know that if we'll shop in supermarkets in 20 years, you know, Zona Su might not be here. But what I learned from my grandfather and from my father is that, you know, if you start something new, if you put your energy into it, you have great rewards, you know, and, and I think I was born to run my own venture, to be an entrepreneur. And that was because I grew up in this environment. This is something I inherited and that I look forward to passing to my kids. Thank you, Enrico Lata, managing partner of Vita Lachi and Yogis. Also, thank you, Dave Evans, co-director of Stanford Life Design Lab and co-author of the book series, Designing Your Life, Designing Your Work Life, and now Designing Your New Work Life. The one last thing that Dave told me about purpose that really struck with me is this. 
It's almost impossible to know by yourself. It's very hard to hear your own authentic voice by yourself. You really need community. We're, we're not built to be alone. Yes, I think as I learned in Kellogg, it's challenges that when you're involved in a family business, it seems ver that are very unique to your family. But when I went to Kellogg and was very active on, you know, the family business groups, I learned and it was very enlightening that we had the same problems as a guy who has five candy shops in Hawaii and the guy who who his father started, founded and invented one of the biggest telecommunication companies in the United States and in the world. Whether it's in our MBA program or executive education programs, come join in a community of family enterprise leaders at Kellogg's Ward Center. We're not meant to be alone. So check out our dozens upon dozens of learning options. Some are on demand, some are interactive programs at wardcenter.net. That's wardcenter.net. In the next episode, You'll hear how having a clearly defined purpose has helped a fourth generation family enterprise leader navigate through a politically sensitive topic and a morally complex situation. Family in Business is a podcast sponsored by the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises and is supported and advised by Professor Jennifer Pennegast, Executive Director of Kellogg's Ward Center, Kane Power is our audio engineer. I am Esther Choi, an adjunct lecturer at the Kellogg's Ward Center, founder of Leadership Story Lab, and author of the book, Let the Story Do the Work. <laughs>